Cape York is contributing a massive contribution to Australia's greenhouse targets by the preservation of vegetation. And yet our people get no credit for that. We'll not achieve the aims we've set ourselves with the Cape York Agenda unless there's a restoration of sanity. And you know, when I talk about self-interest, I mean that Wilderness Society members, they have no ability whatsoever to reduce the carbon footprint of their fathers and their mothers and their siblings and their cousins. They have no ability whatsoever to affect other people in their social world. But they have a terrible ability to reduce the prospects of entire communities. It's not as if these people are not self-interested. They prosper through the machinery of the state. Many of them have good jobs in the bureaucracy. All of them have futures. And yet they want to deny to people who on average earn $12,500 a year, they want to deny a future to those people. And the hypocrisy of it is absolutely astounding. I went to talk to the person in charge of Wild Rivers in the Queensland Government, in the Premier's department. And I said, mate, Adrian, last time I saw you, you were the president of the Queensland Wildlife Preservation Society. But you've discovered that rather than being a lobby group like me, outside in the cold, you've discovered a more efficient way of getting your agenda up. You are now a, a deputy secretary in the department. And how are we supposed to trust the idea that the submissions we make to you on behalf of Aboriginal people are going to be given the same credence as submissions from your old organisation? And throughout the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy is no longer an impartial public servant public service, it is now riddled with people with agendas. And so when we do make the application for the biodiesel project, what kind of shrift will we get from Adrian and all of the other Adrians dotted throughout the bureaucracy? Yeah, perhaps if you guys propose something, your ability to participate in this tension will make it harder for Adrian to resist. But if our mob want to open up a new paddock for cattle or for biodiesel planting, see how much shrift we get. Let me say one last thing about the Wild Rivers legislation which points to the utterly undemocratic nature of The Wild Rivers legislation says that the minister proposes an area for declaration, goes out to public consultation, and if he doesn't proceed to implement that declaration, he has to give reasons. He has to publish reasons under the Wild Rivers Act if he doesn't go ahead with it. This gives green groups and other concerned members of the public the ability to judicially review the minister's refusal to proceed with the declaration. But what if the minister does decide to proceed with the declaration? Well, cleverly, the legislation says that he doesn't have to publish any reasons. Therefore, precluding the possibility that aggrieved members of the public, not the least indigenous landowners, have no ability to challenge the minister's decision. 
So had the minister made a fair judgment and said, well, actually, there's, after, we've, after we've received all these public submissions, we shouldn't proceed with that gazettal. In that case, the Green groups would have an immediate ability to go to court. But the reverse situation, democracy and proper present representation is denied. And this egregious legislation is, you know, the reason it, <laughs> the reason it is like this, it is because the green bureaucrats have designed it thus. And uh, what I would say to Michael is that the message that he must take to the Premier is that this is an absolute outrage. This is an injustice that will never go away. You can't preclude the opportunity for development on behalf of the most vulnerable people in our community. And I care not personally about this. My children will do well. I'm middle class like you guys. My children will get educated. They'll have a future. But the ones I care about are still back in Arakun, back in Lockhart River. It's their children that we've got to secure a future for. And I can't see that future being achieved unless there are rights guaranteed for Indigenous people to undertake sensible development on their land. And the fact of the matter is that no one can point, no one can point to anything that the indigenous communities have done to destroy the environment. 99% of the vegetation in the region is still intact. So I want to say in closing, it's been a long time since I had the opportunity and a very good opportunity to speak with the association and I've been very pleased to receive this invite. I first worked with um, a proposal for the PNG to Gladstone gas pipeline. Michael, I was in fact one of the protagonists behind the original proposal. A small company called IPC Limited first came to us in 1993 with a proposal to get gas out of the Gulf of Papua down into North Queensland. And we worked with them to assure that there would be land access through the peninsula. And he sold, the, the, the IPC then sold on their interest to Chevron. And we negotiated an agreement with 50 traditional island groups between Gladstone and the tip of Cape York, hoping that the PNG gas pipeline project might come to fruition. We still harbour those hopes. There's um, today a, a live easement that exists under Iliwa from the tip of Cape York down to the bottom of Cape York. And the owners of that easement, the traditional owner groups, uh, um, hold that asset of the easement in the hope that uh, one day the, the economics of bringing gas down from the north uh, might work. But that is an example of how it is that traditional owner groups in places like Cape York um, are keen for sustainable development and will actually be proactive in trying to get major projects happening. <coughs> and so I wish all of your members the, all of the best for your gathering here this week. Thank you.